Welcome to part 4 of Let's Play Portal of Evil. At the end of the last part I was about to enter the tournament um, and to do that I have to turn to 190. So let's go there now. Um, you are one of a dozen warriors who push through the crowd and climb onto the platform to volunteer for the tournament. Gloton shoes away all the dignitaries except the Margrave. Attendance, he calls. Um, bring ropes and blindfolds and the animal boxes. Bind each contestant's ankles and blindfold each face, but leave the sword arm free. Place a box in front of each contestant. Turning to you and the other volunteers, he goes on. This first test is of courage, my brave warriors. Have you the courage to remain quite still once the animal is released from, from its box? And at what point does courage become sheer foolhardiness? Let us see who can remain motionless the longest. Release the animals. You cannot see, you cannot move your feet. You can hear a slithering, rasping noise, and then something touches your leg. You control the urge to strike out. Something long and muscular winds itself round your waist. You hear shrieks of loathing and the sounds of fighting as other contestants leap to defend themselves. Feelers with, um, with rubbery suckers probe your clothing and adhere to your skin. A heavy body bumps against your legs as the creature climbs higher. A tentacle reaches your throat and winds, and winds round your neck. You, you remember Gloton's words about foolhardiness. The creature is climbing up the front of your body. Is it time to act? If you force yourself to remain still, turn to 285. If you tear off the blindfold and grab your sword, turn to 130. Okay, we're going to um, remain still. 285. Dozens of pairs of dry, leathery lips nuzzle your face. You manage to remain motionless. After what seems like an eternity, the suckered tentacles relax and the heavy weight of the creature's body slithers down your legs. You, you remove the blindfold and stare at the hideous monstrosity that has been crawling all over you. Well done, says Gloton. Seven of you have passed that test. The animal is a salt sucker, and perfectly harmless as long as you keep still. Uh, the second part of the tournament will test your wits. One of you at a time, please, and Margrave, your assistance would be appreciated. Thank you. Now then, as you pro probably know, in Klein Castle's coinage, two brass pieces are worth one silver piece, and two silver pieces are worth one gold piece. I have six coins, worth a total of three gold pieces. I will give two coins to one of you, two coins to the Margrave, and I will keep two coins myself. The Margrave's coins are of two different types. My coins are both of the same type. What type of coins have I got? Um, I have six coins worth a total of three gold pieces. So he has one gold piece, um, two silver pieces, um, and... Th this is tricky. Um, Second part of the talk will test short wits. Right. Um, two coins to one of you, two coins to the Margrave, and I will keep two coins myself. The Margrave's coins are of two different types. My coins are both of the same type. What type of coins have I got? Okay, I think um, six coins. The, co oh, the coins you have been given are both brass pieces, so, uh, so that helps. So, two brass pieces are worth one silver piece. Um, and he has three... He has... no, he, he has six coins. And they're worth a total of three gold pieces. So he has... So he's given me two brass pieces. Um, which means he probably had four brass pieces and two silver pieces, meaning in total he has um, four brass pieces and this is actually very tricky to work out. So he had six coins and that means and there were a total of three gold pieces. So two 
pieces are would be silver, let's say. Um and that would be one gold piece. And then another one piece would be silver, which means Yeah, I think I've got this, yeah. Uh, I think one piece is gold, that's one gold piece. Two pieces are silver, that's another gold piece worth, so that's two gold pieces, and that's four coins. And then the last two pieces, um, the last three pieces are one silver piece and two brass pieces. So that would be another three coins. So that'd be three coins, one gold piece, two silver pieces, making up two gold pieces, another silver piece. Uh, and, uh, and two brass pieces, which in total makes another gold piece, making six coins in total. I have brass pieces, um, and the margraves, and the margrave, yeah, I have two brass pieces, and the margrave will have um, one brass piece and one silver piece, which means that. Oh no, wait a minute. Um, Oh yeah, that's right, yeah. I have two brass pieces. The Margrave will have um one of the silver pieces and one of the one of the gold pieces that I um hypothesized. Um so and I have the brass pieces, which means the Margrave has the gold piece and the silver piece, which means that um Gloton will have to have the silver pieces. So, yeah, so it must be silver pieces. I already knew it was silver pieces, I just wanted to work it out. Alright, anyway, 147. Yeah, uh, that makes perfect sense. Yeah, the Margrave will have one gold piece and one silver piece. I'll have the two brass pieces I hypothesized, and that means Gloton will have the, the two silver pieces. Anyway, here we go. Um, and all seven contestants have, have given their answers. Gloton opens his fist to reveal two silver pieces. You are one of four contestants who gave the correct answer. You step forward to acknowledge the cheers of the crowd. Now, the last part of the tournament, announces Gloton, will be a test of skill and swordsmanship. We have four brave warriors here, so let us organise two bouts um, for winners to go on to a final duel to find our champion. Um, you are not sure that this is a good plan, and it is clear that your fellow contestants are also displeased. By the end of the tournament, all the contestants will probably be too badly wounded to venture into the forest. You notice that Gloton's servants are armed with wooden pickaxe handles. Would you suggest to Gloton that these would be less damaging than swords, and therefore should be used in a tournament? Or would you decide that the quickest way to prove yourself as champion is to challenge Gloton or the Margrave? to a pickaxe handle duel. Now, if you remember when we spoke to um, spoke to Gartax earlier, he said um, if you want to get on Gloton's good side, challenge him to a pickaxe handle duel. So we're going to challenge Gloton to a pickaxe handle duel because Gloton's actually a dwarf who shaved his beard off and he wears shoes to make himself a bit taller. So we are going to go to 10. You, you don't want to uh, challenge the Margrave. I think he's in, I think uh, they take offence at it and uh, you're punished or something. Um, yeah, so let's turn to 10 and challenge Gloton. If I can find 10. Here it is, I think, yeah. Why is that page slightly a different shade of grey? I don't understand. Um, the Margrave is outraged at your suggestion and orders his men to seize you. Gloton, however, insists that you are brought onto the platform rather than thrown at once into a dungeon. The crowd surges forward to look at you and Gloton speaks out. This warrior knows how a miner likes to fight. Bring two pickaxe handles. We'll, uh, he will settle this here and now. He shrugs off his rich cloak. His body is short and stout, but his arms bulge with muscles. He throws you one of two wooden staves. You circle each other and then close in. The crowd roars its approval. 
when the stamina of either you or Gloden is reduced to four points, you realise that the duel cannot last much longer. You have to decide how you want the fight to end. If you think it would be diplomatic to let Gloden win, you can do so without losing any more stamina. You simply pretend that Gloden's next few blows strike you hard and then collapse and submit. You can instead carry on and and carry on fighting until the stamina of one of you is reduced to only two points and that person submits to the other. When that happens, turn to 314. If you remember what Gartax said, he said to let Gloton win and then you'll get on his good side. So we're going to fight until um, Gloton's stamina, or mine, is down to is down to four points. So let's do that now. I have the dice program as always. One of those two dice and I'm going to have to write in here Gloton because we're fighting Gloton. Um, come on. So let's type in Gloton. Skill it was nine, wasn't it? And the stamina was fourteen. And then enemy attack. Uh, my attack. Okay, let's um, f finish this fight. What's my stats? Uh, 10 and stamina 7. That's not good. So, But we're just fighting, just for, to the first one to get to 4. Um, so, so it shouldn't be too bad, uh, because we... Uh, he won't die, um, even if we choose to, f to fight on, which we're not going to do anyway. So anyway, yeah, his is 9, mine is 10. Let's do this. Him first. Okay, his is 7, that's 16. Mine is 4, that's 14. So, so 16 to 14. And my stamina drops to 5. Let's continue the fight. Okay, he gets a 3, that's 12. I get a 7, that's 17. So 12 to 17. Which means he's put down to 12. Alright. He gets a 2, that's 11. I get 6, that's 16. So 11 to 16. So he goes down to 10. And continue. He gets a 7, that's 16. I get a 4, that's 14. 16 to 14 again. And I think that puts me to 3, which is 3 stamina points, um, 4 stamina points or fewer. So uh, the fight ends there. So let's see what Gloden has to say. Um, yeah, so I collapse and submit. Turn to 389. The thing about uh, that fight is, it doesn't matter if, you, if you're losing, because it's not about the fight, it's just about that you choose to submit. That's the most important thing. You can't die, um, so it's it's just a choice really. The fight is just, um, it isn't important, inconsequential. Only one thing puts Gloton in a better mood than fighting, and that's winning. You have impressed him. He announces to the assembled townspeople um, that only a superlative warrior could last so long against Gloton and his favourite weapon. He cancels the remainder of the tournament and tells the crowd that you are to be their champion. You are deafened by cheers and applause. You shake Gloton's hand and wonder whether you should murmur some complimentary phrase. You could tell him, for instance, that he fights with, this, with the strength and courage of a dwarf. If you do this, turn to 107. If you think it would be better to keep silent, you go with Gloton to prepare for your solo mission. Um, if you remember what Gartak said again, he said to tell um, to tell Gloton that that he fights like a dwarf. So it's turned to turned to 107. All that information comes from Gartax. Um We've just uh, made that smaller there. Doesn't matter. Um, 
Um, Gloton is astonished. You are not only a diplomat and a warrior, he says. It is clear that you are also either remarkably perceptive or very clever, or both. Before we meet the Margrave to discuss your mission, come with me to my house. You accompany the mine owner to his mansion on the outskirts of the town. His servants show you into an audience chamber where you are left alone. Apart from tapestries and a few couches, the only item of furniture in the room is an enormous armchair. It is as big as a throne, and you assume that it is Gloton's chair. While you are waiting for Gloton to return, will you sit patiently on a couch, sit in Gloton's armchair, search the armchair? Um, you can ask Go um, Gartax how to find Gloton's treasure, but there really is no point. If you find it, you run the risk of being trapped underneath the armchair, because that's where the treasure is. And if you do find it, um, Gloton comes in and calls you a thief, and then he won't give you the reward or anything. So it's, you don't want to search the armchair or sit in the armchair at all. Um, just sit on, on the couch. So 211. Um, Gloton enters the room. I'm sorry I've, I've kept you waiting, my perspicacious friend. Um, yeah, if you, you can sit in the armchair and you can decide not to, uh, not to do anything and then he'll come eventually, but it's best just to ignore the armchair completely. Um, how did you, uh, detect my dwarfish origins, eh? I've been looking for a special item that I'd like you to have, but I can't find it anywhere. Only one place to look now, the strong box. Watch this. He clambers onto the seat of the ar of the chair and proceeds to pull at the armrests, lifting first one and then the other with some difficulty. The front of the chair's plinth, which had looked like a solid block of wood, swings open to, re to reveal a cavity. In it is a wooden box. Soon Gloton has the box open and is rummaging through a dazzling heap of coins and gems. He pulls out a battered old hunting horn. Don't look so disappointed, Gloton says. This will be of more use to you than a sack full of jewels. It's a family heirloom, obviously of dwarfish workmanship. Um, take it. Sound it when you are in dire peril. The eagles swore an oath to my forefathers that they would aid anyone who sounds this horn. They will come only once. Now, let us prepare for your mission. Turn to 259. During the evening, apothecaries examine your body for wounds and prepare remedies which you swallow before retiring to the Margrave's guest chamber. You awake next morning invigorated. If any of your scores are below their initial levels, restore them to their full amount. Let's do that now. Does that include luck? I don't know. It doesn't matter because my luck is at maximum anyway. So put this back to 15. It's done. The townspeople gather again and again you are at the centre of a public ceremony. The Margrave presents you with a warrant ordering his subjects to allow you free passage and to furnish you with any help you may require. Gloton gives you a purse containing 10 gold pieces and from and from the wizard, a file containing a potion of true seeing. Let's write all this down. So what did we get? We got the, the Margrave's Warrant. Let's put the capital M. And we got uh, 10 gold pieces. So let's put that up to 19. And we also got Potion of True Seeing. Okay. Um, and the townspeople bring you provisions. You manage to cram enough for five meals into your backpack. Okay, so let's put our provisions back up to ten. Because we have, uh, we're adding five onto that, so so we're fully loaded. Um, all we know, says Gloton, is that 
Somewhere underground, someone has discovered an ancient portal to another world and is using its evil power to create an army of slave warriors out of enslaved forest dwellers. This warlord is probably to be found beyond the portal, in the strange world from which unnatural beasts have issued to plague our countryside. If you can defeat the warlord, your reward will be as generous as your deeds are glorious. Remember, not only the weak are at risk. Horfak and Derlin, two of the wealthiest mine owners, are among those missing. You thank Gloten. If if you have no sword, you borrow one from a soldier, and you set off into the forest. Turn to 22. We do have a sword. We have the, the really good sword from the wizard. So turn to 22. And if you remember, 22 was one of the the paragraphs that we could have gone to right near, near the beginning. So now we go there now properly. So you don't want to go to this paragraph until you've met the wizard and um, met Gloten. Okay. Oh yeah, I forgot to note down that I have the uh, that I have the hunting horn as well from Gloton. That might come in handy. So hunting horn. Um, I just put eagles. Um, right, let's read number twenty-two. In spite of the jagged terrain and thick undergrowth, this part of the forest is a maze of small paths. Most of them run east-west between the mine workings in the mountains and Klein Castle. Branches lead northwards into the hills and southwards into the heart of the forest. The highest peaks of the Cloud High Mountains can be seen above the treetops to the east, and you, and you decide that this is the, is the direction in which you will travel. You have been walking for some time when you hear heavy footsteps behind you. You push on to a clearing where you turn and see your pursuers emerging from the trees. There is a man in the background, but you have eyes only for the bizarre beast that is trotting towards you, uttering high-pitched squawks. It is the size of an ostrich, but with no feathers and with claws instead of wings. The eyes in its beaked head glare down at you as it approaches. It is a struthiomimus. Yes, struthiomimus and it became extinct millions of years ago, but here it is apparently very much alive and intent on attacking you. After three rounds of combat, turn to 189. Okay, so I have to type that out, Struthiomimus 912, okay. Three rounds of combat. Um, Struthiomimus, is that right, Struthiomimus? Yeah. All right. Skill, 9. Stamina, uh, 12. But that will go down. Uh, enemy, whoops, spot that one. Enemy attack. My attack. Whoops. Attack. Right. Okay, let's do this fight, but remember, three rounds of combat. Um... Okay, let's do this. Um, okay, him first. His is 9, mine is 10. Okay, he gets 8, that's 17. I get 7, that's 17. So, 17 to 17. So, no change in stamina for either of us. Okay, next. He gets 11, that's 20. I get 5, that's 15. So, 20 to 15. Okay, so he takes off some of my stamina. Um, so that goes down to 13 now. Next, he gets a 6, that's 15. I get 8, that's 18. So 15 to 18. Okay, that's 2. Um, yeah, that's 3 attack rounds now. So he's down to 10. And that's 3 attack rounds. So let's... Um, turn to 189, like the thing said. In the midst of the deadly interplay of sword, claws and beak, you become aware of a remarkable noise, a low, booming, repetitive bellow that distracts you from your fight. 
the Struthiomimus hears it too. With a squawk, it turns away from you and trots back to the man standing at the edge of the clearing. You see from the man's grey pallor, with his bony limbs poking through tattered clothes and his expressionless, pinched face, that he is one of the enslaved humanoids that have been terrorising this area. It is he who is producing the weird noise, attracting the creature to him. He places a rope round its long neck and then draws a notched scimitar. He advances towards you. If you have a ring of zombie warding, turn to 349, which we do. We, uh, we got it from the wizard. If not, turn to 88. 349. Um, you extend your hand, uh, revealing the inscribed surface of the silver ring. A cone of white light spreads from your hand and envelops the slave warrior who stops, frozen. Then he moves, as if pushing against a, a wall, and the cone of light begins to fade. The slave warrior looks like a zombie, but he is not of the undead. The ring's effect on him is limited, but it has slowed him, allowing you an opportunity to act. Will you use this breathing space to attack the warrior, or will you run out of the clearing along the eastward path? We're going to run, so 264. If we didn't have the ring, we'd have to fight him, I think, so the ring in enables us to escape. Um, on your left, rising above the trees, the bare brown hillsides are pockmarked with mine entrances. You reach, a, you reach a village, an unplanned cluster of cabins, home for the miners and their families. But the village seems to have been abandoned. There is no sound, and doors and shutters hang loose on their hinges, revealing dark, silent interiors. You pause at the edge of the village, and you can hear a noise from the path behind you. It is the tramp of marching feet, and and the guttural sound of men's voices, speaking in the local dialect. Will you wait on the path for the men to arrive, or will you quickly find a hiding place in the village? We're going to wait, because I think this is the Margrave's men. So turn to 41. As you stand at the side of the path, you notice that, that the ancient oak tree whose branches are sheltering you from the sun has a hole in its trunk. Peering into the dark centre of the tree, you can just make out an irregular heap of twigs and dry leaves, and something shiny. If you want to reach into the tree uh, to pull out the heap, turn to 194. If you decide not to do this, you continue to await the arrival of the marching men. Uh, we're going to pull whatever it is out, so 194. You insert your hand into the hole, grab as much of the pile as you can, then, just as you are pulling your hand out of the tree, something inside the trunk grasps um, grasps your forearm between sharp teeth. You shake your hand free and yank it out of the hole. The creature's teeth have drawn blood, but the wound is not serious. Do not one point from your stamina. Say so one point from our stamina. So we're down to 12 now. Um, I will just say that the Ring of Zombie warding, um, Wardings has been used up, so it's been, been used, but, uh, but we still have it, so I won't delete it. To your chagrin, you find that the shiny article in the heap of leaves is a small hand mirror, which you can put in your backpack if you want to, which we will do that. So, hand mirror. You, you are about to throw the twigs and leaves into the undergrowth when you notice that among them is a sprig of swordsies, a very rare medicinal herb that, if swallowed immediately before a battle, enables the body to repair wounds almost as soon as they are inflicted. You may tr chew this sprig once before any one fight and you will find that your opponent reduces your stamina by only one point each time he wounds you. Add one point to your luck for this fortunate find. So. I'll just write that in. So, sprig of swords um, ease, and I'll put in in, in um, parentheses um, use um, one use one use 
Um, stamina loss in one battle is one point per wound. So I'll remember that. Um, the sound of marching men is closer. Turn to 363. A troop of the Margrave's infantry marches towards you along the path. They are led by a sergeant who halts his men next to you and asks you your business. Without waiting to hear your reply, he barks, Never mind about that. I've got no time to listen to your excuses. I've got to search this here village. You come with us. You are escorted into the village at a sword point. 255. Um, you are held under guard in the village square, and before long an officer arrives on horseback. Jumping from his saddle, he brushes dust from his blue cloak and gleaming armour as the troopers salute and the sergeant explains about your capture. The officer strolls over to you. A vagrant, eh? He, he drawls. Explain your business in this area and make it a good explanation for your own sake. Do you have a warrant from the Margrave? If so, you show it to the officer. Turn to 73. Otherwise, turn to 131. Okay, we, uh, we do have a warrant, so 73. What's this piece of old parchment? sneers the officer, snatching the scroll from the hand. As he reads it, his expression remains unchanged, but his face gradually turns white. He gulps, rolls up the warrant, hands it back to you, salutes, and says through gritted teeth, Please accept my apologies. My men and I are at your disposal. You reply that all you require is a rest and a meal, and to be allowed to remain in the village while the troopers search it. The officer orders a couple of soldiers to bring you a table, a chair, and some rations, and you eat a pleasant meal in the village square, restoring up to four points of stamina if you need to. Which I will do, so it goes up to fifteen again. Uh, then you go to find out what, if anything, the soldiers have discovered in the village. Turn to 327. As you wander about the village and chat with the soldiers, it becomes clear that they do not know exactly what they are searching for. Some say goblins, others bandits and renegade miners, while the sergeant seems intent on finding what he calls unnatural and abominable beasties. A small reptilian creature is found and slaughtered. An argument breaks out over a stifle of pigs, with some soldiers wanting to take them home for bacon, while others insist on killing them at once in case they are possessed by demons. All the soldiers are very disgruntled because they can find no gold or other valuable. Eventually they march off into the forest. Do you continue your eastward journey, or do you decide to stay in the village a, li a little longer and search it quickly yourself? We're going to stay a little bit longer. 303. All the huts are similar in both construction and their contents. They are simple wooden buildings with only one or two rooms each. Each contains only a few rugs, straw mattresses and pots and pans. Food, clothing and valuables have been taken away, if not by the villagers themselves when they left, then by gangs of goblins, bandits or soldiers. Among the items that remain are a length of stout rope, a bundle of torches, dried rushes bound together and soaked in wax and pitch, and a miner's helmet. This last object looks looks very like a warrior's helm, but with the addition of a lantern fixed at the front. The, la the lantern has a little door that opens to reveal that the inside surface of the lamp is brilliantly reflective metal which magnifies the light cast by the lantern's flame. The source of the flame would normally be a short candle, but this is missing. If you have a candle stub with you, you will find that it fits perfectly, and that the miner's helmet will provide you with light in dark places while leaving both your hands free. You may keep any or all of the items that you find in the village. And make any additions to your adventure sheet. You then leave, continuing along your eastward path. Turn to 11. Okay, so what do we get? We got... Uh, rope, uh, rope, um, bundle of torches, 
and a miner's helmet. So we have the candle stub. So we have rope, torches, and miner's helmet. And we have the candle stub that goes with it. So uh, that should be handy. And now we're turning to 11. There are fewer paths crisscrossing the forest as you continue eastwards, although the path you are on is still well defined. The woodland round you is dark and silent. You are beginning to wonder whether you have penetrated too far into the forest. And then you see two bodies lying on the path ahead. You approach cautiously. The dead creatures are scurrilers, long-tailed, fur-covered humanoids who live in trees and are very rarely seen by ground dwellers. These two had been on a hunting trip. Each has a bow and an empty quiver and a bag of game birds. They have been shot down with a crossbow. The metal bolts are still embedded in their green leather clothing and soft brown fur. Will you search the bodies or pass them by and continue along the path? Um, what should I do? We're going to pass them by. It could only be a trap, I think. Um, 230. A little further on, the path forks. If you take the wider of the two branches, which leads northeast and uphill towards the mountains, turn to 277. If you take the smaller branch southeastwards into the forest, skirting the hills, turn to 100. Um, wider, I think, 277. Where is it? Uh, I seem to be missing one of the uh, pages again. Is it at the bottom, hopefully? I can't believe the page is missing. There's 276, and then it goes straight to 281. It's tremendously irritating. Um, just h hold on a sec, I'll see if I can find it. Okay, after looking for a bit, uh, that page does not exist. Um, Luckily, though, I do know where to go next. Um, the, uh, the the paragraph that had 277 on it, it just tells you... Um, it, it says there's a, there's a mine, um, and um, do you want to enter it, or something like that. And then when you do, you go to this one. you go to this paragraph here. This is what happens after you enter the mine. I'm, I'm really sorry about that, but the page doesn't exist on the PDF. Um, My name is Azudraz, says the old man, as you follow him into the stone building. You've probably heard of me, the greatest alchemist this side of Baruna. Six months ago, I allowed myself to be dragged up into the wilderness to work for one of these mine owners. Horfak, his name was, though I haven't seen him since he first employed me. He wanted me to invent a perfectly secure method for storing gold, and now, at last, I've done it. It's a two-stage process. The first step is to take all these gold nuggets and drop them into the tank that I've built in the next room. I've managed to carry some of them, but you'll do the whole lot in no time with two arms on this wheelbarrow. Um, you pile gold speckled rocks into the barrow and wheel it through an archway into a room which is dominated by a vast metal tank. Yeah, I forgot to mention that you, you meet the old man and then you agree to help him. So this is why he assumes that you're helping him. Um, pipes of glass and metal snake into and round the tank 
and each other and a wooden ramp takes you up to the rim. The tank is full of clear colourless liquid. Its floor is littered with nuggets. You tip the barrow and watch the load sink through the liquid to form a glittering heap. The tank is wide but not very deep and you are tempted to reach into it to retrieve a nugget for yourself. Will you do so, turn to 95, or will you first test the liquid by dipping a piece of your clothing into it? Okay, we're going to reach in and grab a nugget for ourselves, even though I know what happens. You thrust your hand into the cold liquid and your fingers grab a glittering chunk of gold-bearing ore. It does not move. No matter how hard you pull, how hard you pull, um, the nugget will not budge. It is as if it is set in cement. You withdraw your arm. If you reach in again to try and pick up a small nugget, turn to 186. If you give up fishing for nuggets and return to the other room to help Azudras, turn to 316. Okay, uh, we're going to give up now. If you if you try to reach a smaller nugget, I think your arm gets trapped. So we're going to go to 316. Here it is. You find the old alchemist struggling with a pile of small sacks. There you are, he says. I was beginning to think you'd got stuck somewhere. His laughter, his laughter has a manic ring which disquiets you. When you've shifted all those nuggets, you can give me a hand with these little sacks. Give me a hand. That's a good one. He, he, he. It takes you only a few more minutes to load all the nuggets into into the tank. This is the second stage of the storage process, as Zudraz explains. The powder in these sacks is an invention of mine which I call Igneolite. It will stop anyone getting into this building. If you'll carry on placing sacks all round the walls of both rooms, I'll organise the central fuse. Igneolite goes to work when touched by fire, but when we and the gold are safely tucked away in here, who will look after the birds? Azudraz begins to weep. You are becoming convinced that he is insane. As he starts to connect the sacks together with paper fuses, you take one of the small packages of Igneolite and put it in your backpack. Okay, so we ha now have Igneolite. I'm still really annoyed that that page was missing. I mean, there is, um, I do have the proper book, but I really can't be bothered to go and get it just to read that one page. It's pretty annoying. Um, anyway, we have the Igneolite. Then you have to, then you have to decide: will you leave now, or will you continue to assist the old alchemist with his scheme? Um, it's best to leave now because if you help him, he starts to. Um, he wants to trap you in there and you know he wants to be trapped inside the place with his gold because he's mad so it's best to leave now so turn to 45 You step through the door and hurry away from the building. A strange noise, a series of soft pops overlaid with a sizzling hum, makes you look back. Y you witness the effect of Igneolite. When lit, it bursts forth in a cloud of dust that covers stone and transforms it. You see the in individual blocks of the building's stone walls and slate roof melting, flowing together and re-hardening into one seamless, featureless shape. The building has turned into a gigantic, smooth boulder with the alchemist and his gold... Um, where was I? With the, with the alchemist and his gold sealed into the hollow interior. Igneolite is clearly a powerful substance. You are sure that you will find a use for the small sack of it that you have in your pack. You decide to investigate the mine entrance nearby. Turns to 106. Yeah, I think the page that we missed, the couple of paragraphs we missed, I think one of them says, unless this one does, um, I think one of them says, they're this way to Horfak and Derlin mines or something like that. Um, so you want to go towards there. Remember, Horfak and Derlin were the two wealthy mine owners that were missing. So I think that's what the paragraph says. 
Peering into the blackness of the hillside tunnel, you see that a rockfall has blocked the passage, only a few paces from the timber-framed entrance. Between the entrance and the, and the tumbled rocks there is a narrow doorway, and it is from here that the continuous twittering emanates. If you decide to go through the doorway, turn to 371. There is nothing else of interest on this bleak hillside, so the only alternative is to rejoin the main path. So we're going to go on through the doorway, 371. You enter a narrow chamber carved out of the rock, but the light from the doorway behind you, you see that one side of the room is lined with long shelves, and that the shelves are occupied by hundreds of caged birds. There are more cages than you can count, and each has one, two or three little birds fluttering and trilling inside. Next to you is a sack of seeds and a tub of water, but the little metal cups for food and water inside the cages are all empty. You notice two particularly small cages, each contains a tiny bird, one with red plumage, the other blue. Both cages would fit inside your pack pack and you can feed these two birds and then pack them in with your other possessions if you want to. You can uh, you then either leave the mine or you decide that you will undertake the, la uh, the laborious task of releasing all the birds from their cages. So we have the two birds, so red and blue birds, or red, yeah red and blue birds, and then we're going to release the birds. Now actually I don't think that one was um no because we haven't we haven't met the elves yet yeah I don't think the the signs for Horvath and Derlin mines were there yet because I think we have to meet the um I think we have to meet the elves first anyway we're going to release the uh, the birds from their cages yeah we have yet to get to the Horvath and Derlin um signpost it would be so much easier if that page weren't missing Anyway, it takes you hours to carry all the cages from the narrow chamber to the path outside the mine entrance, where you arrange them in lines with their doors facing the downsloping forest. Then you open the doors and one by one the birds soar into the sky, their colours flashing in the sunlight. The last one flies away but remains nearby, circling over the treetops, and as you watch, all the other birds return, swooping out of the sky. You gaze upwards, entranced, as the blue sky becomes a kaleidoscope of twittering colours. Their separate songs merge at last into a harmonious crescendo, and you understand that the birds, or perhaps the deity that watches over them, are offering you their thanks. They fly away into the forest, restore one point of luck if you need to. Turn to five. Okay, this is where I'm going to end the video um, because the next thing we're going to the next thing we're going to do is we're going to meet the elves. I should be able to I should be able to complete the game in the next part, but yeah, it was annoying that the paragraph was missing and it confused me a bit. I wish it confused me a bit. I thought that the I thought that the um, the Horvath and Derlin sign was before uh, Azudras, but it's actually afterwards. But it doesn't matter anyway. All I knew is that uh, eventually, the first thing we have to do is go and see Azudras, and then we see the, uh, and then we see the um, um, the elves, and then we're going to reach the portal. So, so that's what we're going to do in the next part. We're going to meet the elves go into the portal, go on the other side and, and um, complete the game. So thank you for watching part 4, I'll see you in part 5. Bye bye.